Hey, buddy. How you doing? Oh, I'm actually pretty good. Feeling much better now. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a bit chilly down here, but I'm not, it's, it's nice. Oh, all right, let me get you out of there. It's almost time for the show to start. Ah, perfect. I've been needing to paint. What? T to paint. Just all I've been thinking about down here. How great it would be to paint again. Right. Okay, well, you just hang tight there, and I'll come check on you again tomorrow. Sometimes a viewer will request a game, and I get to it right away, or in a decent amount of time. Or sometimes it gets put off for a really, really long time. Sorry again, Matt. This game was requested when I first started streaming my gameplay footage. And I wanted to do it for an October video, then I got behind on videos, what a surprise, and put it off for another October. And then I got behind on videos and put it off for another October, and you, you notice a pattern with my life? Well, I finally buckled down and played it outside of October. This year, we're playing Layers of Fear. <laughs> Joking aside, this is a really effective horror game in some moments, but that's all there is, is moments and experiences. This is a walking simulator, a special type of game where nothing, not that nothing happens, but it's all set pieces and moments that are strung together. You can't die, you can just progress through and hit more triggers. And if put together poorly, a walking experience is probably the most miserable, frustrating type of game that's out there. But if done well, it might, in my opinion, be one of the most rewarding ways of telling a story that there is. In most moments, this is very well designed, if somewhat derivative. You're a painter, wrought by guilt for what happened to your family. You traverse your madness, trying to create an ultimate painting. The hallways twist, bending back onto itself in many places. Doors lead to completely illogical rooms, and the building seems to work itself against you. For anyone who follows horror games, very obviously it's based off the hit game that came out in 2014, P.T. And while some people I've read afterwards during my research phase have taken issue with this calling it derivative, yes, I don't understand why you would be harsh on it for that. It certainly takes inspiration from P.T. and definitely uses some of its set pieces, but it uses them in its own setting and its own story to build its own world. Yes, you're a tormented husband being followed by the spirits of your wife and child as they punish you for some past misdeed, and you come to terms with that. But there are huge differences. P.T. never told you exactly what had happened. It may have left you enough layers to deduce things, but it never told you. Layers of fear does. It was implied you had directly murdered both your wife and child for unknown reasons in P.T. Whether that be you snapping, her cheating, maybe you hadn't done it and someone else did it because of you. Again, things were up in the air. In Layers of Fear, you drove her to suicide after she was scarred in a house fire and you became obsessive about fixing her. After she died, your insanity began to take more and more hold until Child Protective Services came and took your daughter. You now believe a painting, a perfect painting that is, will bring back your wife and are going through this introspective hell to accomplish that. These are deeply significant differences. Yes, they share elements and similarities, but what they do with those makes a difference. When you break things down to elements and set pieces, a great deal of classic literature and movies are suddenly indistinguishable. One easy example, the book Redwall by Brian Jocks contains mysterious messages that slowly lead the young, growing protagonist into the truth of a hidden secret. Being left eerily as a life-ending threat risks shutting down the immeasurably old and immense building that is the only true home he has ever known. To climactically overcome this danger, the hero must stab a snake through the roof of the mouth with a sword. He is the only chosen hero who could save the day, though all of his friends and allies are definitely necessary for the progress, and grows into more of a hero from this. 
Another book, published 12 years later, stars mysterious messages that slowly lead a young, growing protagonist into the truth of a hidden secret being left as a life-ending threat risks shutting down the immeasurably old and immense building that is the only true home that he has ever known. To overcome this danger and win the day, as only he was fated to do but with the help of his friends, the hero must stab a snake through the roof of the mouth with a sword, and he grows from this experience into a better hero. Now that I've broken down these elements and themes, well clearly this second book ripped off Redwall. There's no reason to ever read this second book, except that the second book that I just mentioned is Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Everything, deliberately or not, is derivative of something else and takes its elements and reuses them. It's what you do with them that makes all the difference. Also, even if Layers of Fear did nothing different from P.T., that means a lot less now in retrospective thanks to Konami's unbridled arrogance, meaning that no one can play P.T. anymore. So a game that's similar to the amazing bundle of terror that was P.T. should at this point only be considered a good thing. That said, some of the moments that Layers of Fear have created are intensely frustrating. Hiding a single small item in a twisting environment or repeating elements far too many times. The first time a ghost jump scares you seems to kill you and you wake up in a new environment, it's terrifying! The second time, it's just as scary! The third time, works too if you keep changing how it happens! The fourth time is tiresome! The fifth time is obnoxious! Small dolls that giggle like children are terrifying, yes, until you run them into walls with a bonk sound effect. That is peak Looney Tunes comedy. When you have shifting rooms and twitching ghosts, slightly macabre and ridiculous paintings help the mood, but are more amusing than scary. And yet, the atmosphere and moments were so intense and enthralling that I kept jumping, I kept being unsettled. Even when I got stuck on a puzzle for almost 20 minutes because I didn't think to look up, once I did look up and see something MC Escher would have scratched his head at, it was incredible! I had to physically pause and catch my senses. Is it done? Thank God, let me out. Restless memories, I don't give a shit. I take it back, I give a shit! So many of the moments knew how to be understated and build up a scare properly. You would fall into a groove of exploring the world only for the rug to be ripped out from under you. And that ending, oh man, that ending. If you have not played Layers of Fear yet, I would strongly suggest you go check it out. So if you don't want things spoiled for you, skip to the time code on screen. I got the middle ending of the three, and all three are so poignant, so amazing, that you finish this perfect picture only for it to morph and laugh at you and become ruined, taunting you. That was intense enough, but it wasn't fully fulfilling. I've seen a few other reviewers talk about how this ending meant nothing, didn't explain anything, and just didn't feel rewarding, and I think this is what they were talking about. I think they saw this ending, found themselves wandering the house again, and stop playing because it was done. But even here at the end, the devs have left details for us. This is the house as it's meant to look, as it really is. We are in a brief moment of clarity from the insanity that has clung to us every other moment of the game. Despite not being... Wait, but they're all perfect. But they're all perfect. We've been painting amazing, perfect paintings for decades now. It's all just in our own head. And as you re-enter the painting studio, the lights and the shading change. The dull, broken down house is gone and the studio returns to its full glory. Another canvas waiting for us to try again. This is so incredibly poignant. Yet it leaves enough questions that it will stick with you. The other two endings are just as deep, and mother and child ending seems to have the final answers. You as the player have been waiting for, and the self-portrait ending letting him fall into the deepest point of madness and suggesting that sometimes maybe that unhealthy state is what pushes some of the greatest artists. Alright, now that you're all back, I'd like to discuss and criticize something that I was just saying good stuff about. 
I was expressing that I got the middle of three endings, and that the endings are all spectacular. So of course I went back and I got the other two, right? No. Two big issues. Different endings don't change gameplay, so it's the same game repeatedly. The environments are really cool the first time, but the game has no innate replayability. Every set piece will be the same, so instead of a jump scare being well set up and unexpected, it instead is you running around a room trying to find the trigger for a jump scare you know is coming. All the tension of the experience is gone. All the wonder of seeing what will happen next has passed. And now it becomes tedium as you try to traverse what you've already seen. But secondly, the endings just aren't implemented well. You get the middle ending I did by doing a mixture of stuff but not enough of either. Most people will get this ending unless they try because the others are so obscure and meaningless. You get what most consider the good ending by moving towards your wife and child's spirit to be killed. I did this with my wife once out of curiosity, once by accident, and once because I was sick of being killed repeatedly to transport me around, so I just ran at her. But my daughter's spirit was a twitching little baby doll in red. Yeah, no, I didn't walk at something straight out of my worst nightmares. Why would that be part of the good ending? But wait, that's not all! You also have to push the wheelchair, something I didn't even think to try since nothing else not giving a button prompt in the world was interactable. You then need to pick up only the items that belonged to your wife in the world. There will be random pictures and items sitting around the world, and when picked up, it'll play you a voice clip from your past. But, riddle me this. Even if you explore enough to find all of the items, how will you know which belong to who? Sometimes whatever is interactable just blends into the clutter and means nothing and you could pick it up only to realize that it belongs to you instead of your wife. In addition to all of that, you need to not do what gets you the bad ending. Pardon me for not figuring out how to get the good ending, but so then, what gets you the bad ending? You have to firstly never approach your wife or child, instead run away until they kill you anyway. Good to know that status quo is maintained no matter what. Then pick up the opposite items in the world that all associate with your past, not your wife's. And finally, follow the rats. Follow the rats? The thing that you've been constantly complaining about? That there are rats everywhere and that you hate them? Yeah, he was likely hallucinating them, but follow them? And this feels even more like punishment to the player, since rats are the only other living things. By the end of the game, a lone rat feels like your friend, making its little squeaking noises and running on ahead. But no, shame on you, you should have known not to do that. And worst of all, looking at the paintings! Apparently, looking at the things in the environment that you are meant to look at and wonder about is bad. Shame on you. Guess I'll remember that next time I'm at a museum. And for total clarity, to get the middle ending, I walked towards my wife every time, but not my child. I followed about half of the rats, picked up every item I found no matter who it turned out to belong to, didn't push the wheelchair, and looked at paintings constantly because they were weird and cool, and that is what paintings exist for! Look. In the end, this is still a great game that I think everyone should experience. Just play through the game and don't worry about your ending. Explore everything, see everything, and you'll get the same ending I did with all of its strength and its poignancy. Just remember that when you finish, exploring the house at the end is just as much a part of that ending as actually the cutscene that comes before it is and you'll have an amazing time. And just don't stress yourself over the other two endings. Look them up, be aware they exist, and how they enrich the story.